हम एट गो बैशना लास्ट ईयर नेक्स्ट लाइट प्लीज सो दिस इज दिस प्रोसेस ओवर द लास्ट ईयर द जर्नी सो फार हैज बीन अ जर्नी रियली ऑफ ऑफ ट्रू कोलेब्रेशन ट्रू पार्टनरशिप it's been uh, an enormously gratifying experience to see the commitment the enthusiasm and the energy that all of the stakeholders and the members have brought uh, to this process they have been uh, enthusiastic they've been willing and it's really because of that uh, energy and enthusiasm that we are where we are today with a rich portfolio of activities that you will hear about with a set of principles that we are strongly advocating for with a robust <clears throat> and growing program where we are hoping uh, at the at this time next year uh, at gobeshna to have uh, even more uh, outcomes and more results to demonstrate in terms of this shift that we are seeking uh, in the research action landscape in the delivery and creation of knowledge to support action and in the delivery of resources uh, to the global south to make that happen uh, next please uh underlying this paradigm shift is a theory of change i will not walk you through that obviously today all i would like to signal is that the uh, from the alliances perspective we see ourselves as serving three key functions a function of advocacy and our principles which we will hear about are obviously one critical element of that advocacy for the kind of change we want to advocate for but it's not enough to simply advocate for change you have to be the change yourself and to do that uh we have a very interesting set of activities around tracking learning and sharing aditya has been very deeply involved with making that a reality and that's something that we hope will just make uh a much more effective deployment of resources which is our third key function which is really how do we mobilize and deliver resources uh to institutions in the global south to networks and communities to uh, enable them to to link knowledge and have more effective action and through all of that is really our uh, the outcomes we want to achieve in our mission which is ultimately at the end of the day uh, advancing the adaptive capacity and building the resilience uh, of vulnerable communities so with that a little overview uh, next slide please uh, with that uh, overview i'd like to uh, end with a bit of a, a hint to what comes next as i mentioned as part of our advocacy we have created co developed really these principles which are intended to signify the dimensions of this shift we are seeking uh in terms of making research more user centered demand driven making it co produced where there are no users or producers but really they are equal partners in that enterprise to research that emphasizes impact but and that builds capacity for the long run uh and and does it in a way that addresses some of the root causes of vulnerability that i mentioned the the issues that put us at risk in the first place which have more to do with our existing inequalities and structural and systemic deficit uh, as much as it has to do with the climate hazards that we face and through this whole process foster a approach towards learning because as i said Uh, one of the central challenges in adaptation is that we are responding to an uncertain future so we need to be flexible and we need to be able to adapt as new knowledge and new understanding of that uncertain future becomes available uh so with that uh, i'd like to again thank uh, gobeshna for giving us this platform to come back here uh, this past year uh, has been critical for the alliance uh, indeed uh, where we are today we owe a very big debt to gobeshna for making it happen uh, because it's exactly where we got started uh, a year ago uh, so with that let me hand this back over to you aditya and thank you again very much anand thank you so much uh, for those framing comments um and for telling us about the history of the development of this uh, wonderful alliance we now have with us jesse de maria kinney who is the head of the secretariat of the ara where a uh, small global team that has been working with 145 plus organizations over the past many months to make this alliance that we had committed to building last year gobeshna a reality and jesse is our fearless leader so since he is so fearless we give asked him to perform a magic trick today by giving us uh, an overview of the entire 
extremely packed year of the ARA's development in 10 minutes. Jesse, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Aditya. And thank you for, as usual, keeping the hard talk lighthearted. Um, so uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Uh, as you've heard, we're very pleased for you to join us today, uh, kind of a year on from the soft lunch. Uh, and last year was indeed a very exciting year as the Secretariat, um, as I did to mention, worked with ARA members to develop the Alliance uh, on many fronts. Uh, many of these were actually a proof of concept or, or kind of a pilot activities to developing um, specific work streams and activity areas that I'll touch on in a moment to also putting the governance structure um, in place. So this will be a bird's eye view and I will take a, it'll be a whistle stop tour, um, but let's take a quick look at that. So next slide, please. Um, and uh, next one as well, there we are. Great, so first, yes. So first, as you can see, um, we carried out two uh, key work streams or activity areas that are before you, which is the evidence reviews and the consultative processes. So first, uh, the evidence reviews were, were really put in place to help provide some analytical backstopping um, by reviewing and synthesizing information that we're able to collect from a variety of sources to help flesh out the broader vision of the ARA, but also some of the activities themselves. And we did this by pulling together diverse views and knowledge types, uh, as, as Anand said, to bring science and knowledge into the space of action. And you can see on the screen, there are three different uh, evidence reviews that were carried out. The first was really just simply identifying uh, iconic examples of action-oriented research. The second uh, evidence review then went a bit more in detail into looking into what are the good practice, and it took, looked at 20 projects to really help understand and provide examples um, of what is action research or, or research for impact. In the third, uh, we worked very closely with our ECAD colleagues and the V20, or the Vulnerable 20 group, which is a part of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, and we developed uh, a brief and an infographic based on the information that we found in the evidence reviews, really that was helped strengthen and making the case for increased national investment um, in adaptation research and investing national capacities and resources into that. Um, this is something that is still ongoing, um, but one of the, again, one of the areas that we're working on within the, the evidence reviews to contribute um, not only the work internally that we're, we're helping promote within the alliance itself and the secretary, but actually, again, the members who are working with. Uh, secondly, we had the consultative processes where we helped to identify um, priority research and knowledge needs. So kind of the opportunities uh, and then the, also the knowledge gaps. And we did this by bringing together um, research and action communities and, and networked in collaborative ways. As you can see, there were four consultative processes that were led by members. Um, and each of these resulted in a chair summary, which is available on our web pages. Uh, also, just to say that these were also designed to help feed into other processes. So, for example, the global health consultative process actually contributed to a large call that is currently open on the National Institute for Health Research in the UK. Um, so, again, we're trying to, to unearth these, these opportunities and knowledge gaps to help contribute to other ongoing programs. Similarly, the climate risk assessments and LDCs um, contributed to one of the air activities that I'll mention here, but looking at continuing the work on climate risks, which, as Anand mentioned earlier, is really core to, to our work. Next slide, please. Um, and these, uh, these activities, the evidence reviews and the consultative processes, as I mentioned, really a, a proof of, of concept in the lead up to COP26, where we had our, our formal launch, um, as well as other activities there. Um, the, the launch uh, saw commitments from the UK and Canadian governments, as well as the Global um, Mobile Service Providers Association, GSMA, and the Global Innovation Fund, or, or GIF. Uh, we had 99 members at the time of the launch, um, which was up from the 33 at the previous Gobishona conference, and now uh, up to the over 140, as Aditya had mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. So this, as I mentioned, the membership drive has been, um, it's actually been a very exciting and pretty amazing part of the year. Um, so moving from 33 organizations at Gobishona, the last Gobishona to 99 at COP, and now is it over the 140. And these members, um, as Anand also mentioned, are really global organizations such as UNDP, UNEP, World Resources Institute, down to really local and grassroots organizations. Um, next slide, please. So as you can see here, um, we have uh, a variety of organizations that, that make up the membership, but the most are coming from the research institutes and NGOs. And there's also quite a geographic spread 
with about half coming from the global south. Um, and this is some an area that uh, we will continue to grow. Uh, we have continued membership coming in. And we also really want to, to start prioritizing and targeting areas, particularly geographically, um, that, that we don't have um, kind of an equal representation. So really strengthen the representation in areas um, where there's a bit, of, a bit of a gap from the number of members. Next slide, please. This, okay, so sorry. So now moving on a bit from, from last year. Um, so I am going a bit over my, my remit here, Aditya, just to touch a little bit on not only the past year, but a little bit of what's ongoing. So I guess we're carrying over the past into the present. Um, so this saw some other, a couple of other exciting activities that are still ongoing. One of these, as you can see before you, is the micro grants. Um, and the micro grants were 30 micro grants, where in the end we awarded 27 to organizations uh, who were interested and wanted to, to identify burning issues uh, in their countries or in the regions and then put in place a, a co-production or a co-creation process. Now, these could have been building on ex ex existing initiatives or projects, or really just identifying something that they saw as being a critical issue that wasn't being addressed. So right now we have um, 27 grantees who have been working hard on this. They've gone through a, a global workshop, um, some, some co-production processes in the meanwhile, and next month we'll be having regional workshops where the, the organizations will come together to really share um, what has been happening throughout this process and learn from each other as well within the regions. So speaking of learning, next slide. Another activity that we have ongoing are, as I mentioned, this came out of the consultative processes on the climate risk assessments and LDCs, and this is uh, the climate risk learning journeys. And the climate risk learning journeys um, have been really to bring together um, various actors, very individuals from their organizations who are working on climate risk to help us really really deepen the understanding of climate risk, of moving away from just understanding the biophysical impacts of climate change to understanding the more social uh, and other vulnerabilities and risks that are that are actually felt by, by people on the ground. And then how do we actually, um, how do we work together to help identify and, and develop these risks? Um, so just to say that of these organizations um, and these individuals, we have representation from, from Uganda and Brazil, uh, Bangladesh, Zimbabwe, uh, Kenya, Indonesia, as well as some regional actors um, that work across countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Um, and next slide, please. And just the last part here, and I believe I'm just going on to the 10 minutes here, Aditya, uh, is really just to say that um, the activities that we have coming up um, are another evidence review that's looking at funding models and mechanisms. Um, also a high level commentary um, paper about action research really outlining kind of the importance of it. Um, and then as Anand mentioned before, a very interesting and online platform that's coming up that is part of an overall tracking learning and sharing strategy for the Alliance. Um, this is currently, well, actually the tender just closed. So we'll be we hopefully finalizing um, and kicking off the start of the, of, the, of the platform development for a standalone website, as well as let's say the IT infrastructure for this tracking sharing learning platform. And then the last area, um, but not least, is a co-creation space, um, which is well anticipated. And what we really want to do here um, is bring together these various actors that we have um, to really help co-create co um, new programs. And these can be new programs on a large scale, such as a program like Claire, but they could also be smaller, um, more geographic focused or thematic focused programs as well. Um, and this would begin a, across the membership base from, from some of these large international organizations down to to bringing in and particularly getting the views from, um, from some of the, the smaller grassroots organizations. And I believe that is it. Um, I think that was hopefully a bird's eye view of the ARA in, from last year in 10 minutes. Jesse, thank you so much uh, for that masterful presentation. Um, now, that, that indeed, as you said, was a bird's eye view, but to ensure that everyone attending today uh, understands in a bit more detail some of the key, some of the marquee uh, activities that we've run over the past um, few months. We have some very special guests with us today. Uh, so therefore, I'm going to transition to the next component of the session, where we're going to first speak to uh, Julio Araujo. Uh, Julio, you work with South South North. A very warm welcome um, to this panel discussion. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and what is South South North before we get to um, some of the more uh, focused questions. 
Sure. Thanks, Aditya. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. So I'm Julio Rougeau, and I am a program manager at South South North, which is a climate change and sustainability NGO based in Cape Town, South Africa. So we basically house uh, several programs around climate change and sustainable development across various regions um, in the world, focusing on various elements from things like climate finance, um, climate information, uh, building the knowledge base and um, brokering knowledge between the kind of research um, space and the actors um, that would be using that information. Thanks a lot, Julio. Uh, Jesse talked about the micro grant initiative and you led this initiative. So tell us a little bit about why uh, uh, you were as part of the Adaptation Research Alliance initiated this process and what this will deliver. Sure. So there really are a couple of ways that we can, we can look at this. Um, from a knowledge perspective, uh, really wanted to use the micro grant to, to gain a better understanding of the knowledge needs for action. Um, we wanted to understand the role of collaboration between knowledge and action and um, how this kind of enhanced collaboration can lead to co-developed solutions. Uh, we also wanted to use the micro grants as a way to generate uh, new knowledge, particularly around identifying issues, opportunities and solutions within a regional country. Um, we wanted to kind of answer this question on whether there are any similarities across countries or region on the particular issues or solutions that are identified by these um, local organizations. So there's, there really is a kind of strong knowledge component towards this. Now, if we look at the microgrants as a kind of wider vehicle that helps the ARA to step closer towards improving the adaptation space, uh, uh, you know, through achieving our expected outcomes, then perhaps uh, it may be important for us to kind of step back into a couple of these outcomes that um, were uh, looked at earlier, particularly um, around how the ARA will deliver increased profile for action-oriented research, um, increased funding in developing countries, capacity building, and strength in collaboration. So if we look at those as a package, then the microgrants a really a great way to contribute towards these outcomes such that they promote action research and transdisciplinary approaches. Uh, the projects are all led by organizations in the country or region that is facing the burning issue. And therefore there's, there's a very strong local relevance to the knowledge that's being generated. Um, if we look at the funds for the micro grants, these are directly injected into the countries and in many cases provide the necessary funds for small organizations to be able to lead action research approaches, particularly for those that are not part of these kind of usual suspects um, slash, you know, the more elite organizations, institutions um, that are typically secure donor funding. So this microgrant process um, also starts the process of building capacity and co-production. And this was kind of the the main approach that um, was specified in the grants that we wanted everyone to um, you know, take on. And then lastly, the micro grants also designed around um, this idea of strengthening existing networks and collaborations. And then on the other hand, generating new networks and collaborations. Now, if we look at this in terms of the impact, we'd expect that the micro grants um, would deliver new knowledge on the local issues and potential solutions. Um, this knowledge could be used to support local decision-making around adaptation, and it could also be used to influence the direction or perhaps even the emergence of new adaptation projects. And, you know, we, we really do expect the microgrants to dive into this network um, space. So establishing strong networks and collaborations around adaptation issues that can really continue uh, to interrogate these issues and solutions that are kind of looked at within this process long past the, create, the, the completion of the grants themselves. Great, Julio. Thank you so much um, for that very articulate response to my very general question. Uh, <laughs> sorry, before I go to uh, our other guest, Julio, very simply, can you lay out for those attending the session uh, in terms of the three or four steps, what really was the micro grant process?
So the microgrant process is, is really it's centered around, around co-production. So we wanted to have local institutions that would identify these issues themselves, create their own process for identifying these issues with the wider community within their regions and use that co-production approach that um, they developed to generate new knowledge. Um, so, and then going forward from that, it's taking this new knowledge and sharing it again back with the, um, you know, with relevant actors within the region so that um, there's uh, kind of an element of learning that can be um, added to this process. Thanks a lot, Julio. We're also delighted to have with us today, Tom Randa from Aaron. Tom, a very warm welcome to this discussion. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Tell us a little bit about yourself and about the organization and the network that you're linked with. Uh, thank you so much, Edita. Um, my name is Tom Randa, um, a researcher with the Africa Research and Impact Network, um, a network of um, over 3,000 uh, fellows drawn from the research space, uh, policy makers and practitioners um, across Africa. And um, uh, one of the themes that we um, are keen on is climate adaptation, um, which we are talking about here. So in the network, we are keen on upscaling um, best practices drawn from the local actions, local research, um, of course, co-produced at uh, various level from the um, grassroots levels or the um, sub-national government level at the local communities, then upscaling these lessons and um, uh, best practices right. to the global space. Uh, uh, global space. Um, yeah. Tom, thank you for that. Um, now imagine that you've entered a 20 story building and there's an elevator in front of you. And when you get into the elevator, someone asks you, Tom, I believe you were part of the microgrant process. You have only 20 stories of the elevator to explain to that person what was the microgrant process and your particular project uh, as part of this process. Uh, thank you so much. Um, um, for the micro grant that we are implementing with the support of um, ARA, um, it's on uh, co, uh, co assessing uh, climate risk, um, a climate risk within the urban informal settlements and a case study of Mukuru informal settlements uh, of Nairobi. And this particular study or um, co assessment was driven by the fact that. Um, um, many of the times that uh, at, at the local voices of um, communities at the local level um, are, are, are missed uh, in the adaptation planning uh, processes and implementations. Uh, the choice of Mukuru um, in Nairobi as a case study for informal settlements is drawn from the fact that um, recently um, the Kenyan government through the Nairobi city county government um, adopted Mukuru to be the uh, first special planning area to kind of improve the infrastructures and basic services within, uh, within that informal settlements. And that gave us a chance to um, uh, include or uh, push for uh, the integration of climate risk knowledge in the planning processes and the improvement of um, uh, infrastructures and services um, within that informal settlement. The micro grant we are implementing, we uh, adopted um, a multi-level kind of assessment, uh, which we call the community labs. Uh, so we develop uh, an integrated tool um, following a review of various tools uh, for climate risk assessment, because there are many, uh, but we wanted those which are implemented in informal settlements. Uh, after developing this tool, we wanted to implement it uh, on our yeah, implement it within the multi-level uh, and we are doing it at the household level, which we call the community adaptation um, uh, 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 household level. Then we do the community organizations within Mukuru. We implement this tool and 
uh, assess uh, at their level of understanding of the climate risk within Mukuru and what they've been doing to adapt to this climate risk uh, historically and what they want done uh, in the future. Um, so we move from the household level to the community organization level. Then we also um, engage the NGOs working within that informal settlement separately and gather their inputs. And then we go to the decision makers and policy maker level. Um, so we separate the different levels so that um, the different groups and special groups within those spaces or community labs can have enough time and ample time to um, give their inputs. Um, at the end of it all, we are coming up with um, a climate risk map for Mukuru, a tool um, or profile, a simple tool which can be used to engage further uh, to influence the decision making, the planning processes within Mukuru. Thank you, Edita. Thank you so much, Tom. That's really fascinating. Tom, tell us about sort of one tangible benefit either for uh, for end users or beneficiaries or for your own institution uh, through this microgrant process and about one hurdle or a challenge that you faced. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think I'll start with the benefits, uh, which are many. Um, basically, this particular process allows us to get um, an inclusive uh, kind of tool or profile, a climate risk uh, profile for Mukuru, which can be used to um, engage further in um, the special planning area planning and uh, the implementation of um, the infrastructure and basic services that the government uh, is undertaking. And, um, um, and that is a benefit on its own, um, uh, cutting across to different um, stakeholders. But again, um, giving us a chance, that tool will give us a chance to integrate the climate risk knowledge uh, in the planning process. Um, another uh, benefit which I can mention is the replicability of this particular process. Uh, because uh, Mukuru is just one SPA within Nairobi, um, other SPAs will be declared or informal settlements um, uh, may want to uh, kind of use this particular tool and process. And again, through the Africa um, or the ARI network, um, this particular process can be upscaled to other parts of uh, the world. So that replicability, we are developing a tool and a process that can be re uh, replicated elsewhere. And um, uh, it's giving us a chance to have a comprehensive uh, locally led climate risk map um, uh, produced to have uh, strategic engagements um, uh, to influence the government processes but also um, the community processes in terms of adaptation. Um, in terms of the challenges faced, I think uh, one of them which is standing out is time and resource allocation for these particular processes. Engagements require a time because there are dialogues, especially with different um, stakeholders, especially the government and the decision makers. Um, that was um, a bit limiting. Um, another challenge which I think I can mention is the political season we are in in Kenya. So uh, we are having elections in uh, three or four in, in August. I think it's five months away. So the campaigns are there and all these processes and engagements um, draws the attention of uh, the political class. So we have to balance that out even when we are meeting the community members and having this kind of dialogues. Um, the last one challenge, I think, is the COVID restrictions, uh, which is binding. Um, we had to limit the number of um, people and um, observe the COVID rules within the juridic uh, jurisdiction of um, uh, uh, Nairobi. So that was also a limiting factor. Uh, we had to cut the numbers, but also limit the, um, the engagements uh, because we had to do it physically. Yeah. Tom, thank you so much. If the Alliance was to run this process again, as I know they hope to, what would your advice be on things that we should do differently? Uh, thank you so much. I think the process has uh, been well planned and organized. 
uh, if uh, it was to be done differently, I think um, the main issue would be um, a, 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 a longer period of time and maybe um, uh, more resources for engagement. So um, uh, uh, projects or micro grants kind of, which are selected uh, with um, numerous engagement activities, which require some time and uh, more resources. But again, I think uh, if it was to be done differently, the second thing would be to kind of have a mechanism um, to track down uh, specific processes or um, uh, projects or micro grants that have uh, a potential of um, expanding to other areas so that um, um, a, a, a greater impact is felt because, um, for example, Mukuru is just one. But if you want to have a, a much more impact, then a, a, a whole city like Nairobi, all the informal settlements could adopt this so that the impact is felt at the city level and the lesson scaled out to other parts of uh, the world so that um, a more global kind of impact is felt. Otherwise, I think the process has been well planned and implemented and thanks to the African um, Adaptation Research Alliance. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. I want to put Julio on the spot again to see whether he might have a response to what you just said in terms of advice for the ARA and how that might align with what uh, he's planning as for the next steps or the next phase. Sure. Thanks, Aditya. Um, yes, I think, uh, especially with the, the feedback that we've received so far, um, this kind of microgrant process has been um, very... Um, very important and it's been very well received within the countries and regions and I think there's a lot of excitement around this. Um, I definitely think there's there's opportunities for us to take things forward and as you kind of mentioned in the beginning there's the ARA you know would like to continue the, this type of work. Um, ultimately we, we do acknowledge that these processes do require a long time. I mean, any type of co-creation process requires, you know, if, you, if we are to do things, um, you know, very carefully and very and appropriately, then these co-production processes can typically take up to, you know, six months to a year and sometimes even more than that. So in acknowledging that these co-creation processes do take a long time and they do require a lot of resources, that is something that um, the ARA needs to um, kind of look at in how we manage these going forward. Thanks a lot, Julio. Uh, wonderful, a uh, big thank you to both of you for explaining this uh, really important initiative uh, in detail. Tom, Celine has posted a very important question for you in the chat box. I'd be most grateful if you could answer that. And I suspect um, that is probably uh, something also that should be taken up in a longer conversation between the both of you. Um, but do try and respond in the chat box to the best of your ability. And then if both of you want to continue talking afterwards, great. We might also have a chance to share our views in a few minutes when we have a short interactive exercise that we're all going to engage in. Now, along with this micro grant initiative that we've been talking about over the last 10 minutes or so, we had another really exciting initiative running concurrently, which was the learning process on understanding climate risk, which was run by Nora Nisi, my colleague from the International Institute for the Environment Development. Nora, a very warm welcome to this um, uh, panel discussion. Tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, what is the IIED before we launch into the meat of the discussion. Thanks, Aditya. Um, yes, as you mentioned, my name is, is Nora. Um, I currently am doing a research and project management for IIED, uh, which stands for the International Institute for Environment and Development, which is a bit uh, long-winded. It's uh, IIED is an independent policy research institute uh, based in the UK, London, and Edinburgh. Um, the research for IIED spans um, quite a few thematic areas, such as climate change, uh, human settlements, natural resources, and sustainable markets. Um, and I mean, IID's stated mission is to build a fairer, more sustainable world using evidence, action, and influence in partnership with, with others. So that's a little bit about uh, IID and myself. Wonderful. Nora, what was this learning process on understanding climate risk? 
How did it unfold? What did it aim to achieve? Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think, I mean, a lot of it's quite, you know, it's in the title, um, Understanding Climate Risk and, and, a, and a Learning Process. The ARA and its members had identified climate risk um, as a vitally important area of learning um, and collaboration for the Alliance. The shared learning process on climate risk actually built off of findings of a consultation project uh, process on climate risk assessments in least developed countries and LDCs that was carried out on behalf of the ARA by CSAG, uh, the Climate System Analysis Group of the University of Cape Town. And that, consul that consultation process um, by CSAG highlighted the importance of collaboration, learning and sharing in, in climate risk uh, assessments and management. And so the learning process and understanding climate risk brought together 57 local, national and international organizations and institutions from across the world. Um, and the process involved two virtual global workshops uh, at the start, accounting for different time zones, and then three virtual regional workshops, um, one in, in Latin America, one in Asia, and one in Africa. And they this took place between January and March of this year. Um, between the global and regional workshops, uh, there was a co-developed learning exercise that participants completed um, as well, which was a series of, of questions. Um, 30 participating organizations, um, uh, sorry, 33 participating organizations actually received financial support uh, from the ARA um, based on some objective parameters to take part in this, um, which was around £3,000 each. In terms of what um, the process aimed to achieve, it aimed at basically three things. The first one was to catalyze peer-to-peer -peer learning and collaboration amongst ARA members and other organizations on climate risk, climate risk assessments and management. Um, second was to generate a shared understanding of climate risk and challenges in understanding climate risk. Uh, and then the ARA could then utilize this information to work towards overcoming these challenges and understanding the good practices that the ARA can amplify. And then the third was to forge regional networks on, uh, on climate risk uh, management. That's about it. That's my um, elevator pitch. <laughs> no, that, that's very clear. But I'm going to push you a little harder. You mm -hmm. use a lot of big words, co-development, co-creation, peer-to-peer learning, yeah. collaboration, network building. If, if you cut through all that, can you tell us one thing that in your mind this learning process has really achieved tangibly? You know, did people understand how to measure climate risks better? Did they build oh. relationships with other organizations? Sorry, Aditya, I think the interpretation just cut into the um, into the question and I, I lost the last part. What, what, did, what was the last part of your question? Sorry. After uh, making fun of the big words that you used, um, yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you uh, to explain as tangibly as possible, maybe one example of the benefit mm -hmm. of this learning process for the people who participated in it. Um, that's a difficult question because uh, there were quite a few, but thank you for pointing out, uh, cutting through some of the, um, the vernacular that I used. I think, I think a big part of this was basically understanding what the knowledge on climate risk was from participants and the experience that they had in climate risk and understanding climate risk in, um, in generating climate risk information, in sharing climate risk information, or in, you know, just the challenges and the, um, the current experiences around understanding climate risk was really fascinating. Um, we had one process where we asked participants to, to talk about their needs and their offers and basically what they needed to better understand climate risk. This might have been access to data, it might have been better communication um, with meteorological offices um, in, their, in their country, it might have been, you know, de-jargonizing, um, taking down paywalls to understand climate risk, and then also what they could then offer you know, they have expertise. If you are um, working, there was one organization working with coastal communities in an area of, um, and I think it was at this point, Mexico. Um, and they have very, very kind of localized knowledge 
on what local communities need to better understand climate risk and how that can be communicated to, to local communities. And that was kind of their offer um, that you know, if other local organizations are working with coastal communities or other organizations would like to understand what coastal communities need to better understand climate risk, that this is their expertise that they bring to the table, but also the challenges that they face. Um, and that was really enlightening. Um, and then for other organizations, and I think the next person who you're going to interview is going to talk a lot to this, but also, you know, for them to then see in their region, in their country, who else is, is working on climate risk and what they're doing. Um, a little bit of a long-winded response, but that's kind of to me. No, I think, really, I, I, really I think that's really fascinating. I think what you're saying is that this process has led to the establishment of a knowledge marketplace for uh, tools, techniques, approaches, information on understanding climate risk. Nora, thank you so much um, for being with us today. I'm going to now see whether one of the people who participated in this process agree with what you just said. Um, <laughs> Sumitra Srinivasan, a very warm welcome to you um, on this panel discussion. You work with Priya. All of us in India know Priya really well. But tell us a little bit about your work and your organization before we dive into the details of this uh, process that you engaged in. Thank you, Aditya, and thank you to the ARA for uh, giving me this invite to participate in this discussion. Uh, it's been fascinating up till now. My name is Sumitra, and I'm associated with an organization. Uh, Aditya used the, the, the uh, short form of it, Priya, but in, it is actually participatory research in Asia. And we are a 40-year-old organization who have been using the principles, methods, approaches of uh, participatory research in empowering and uh, organizing marginalized communities uh, in order to make them visible and to make them heard uh, to the institutions that are responsible for, you know, delivering, quote unquote, delivering development to them. Uh, I specifically work uh, with the function of uh, systematization, knowledge management, and communication of the work that we do. Great, Sumitra, thank you. Tell us how this learning process contributed to the way in which you understand climate risk? Well, um, if I, if I, I'll speak from personal, you know, learning and sure. uh, I, there were a couple of things which um, I think one which got clarified to me sort of, you know, it, it sort of came, it came to the forefront of my mind and the other, which I was, I, I was actually not aware of. And uh, the first thing was, you know, um, what is risk and risk was, it, I understood or clarified that risk is actually perception. Uh, it's not just uh, that associated with climate related phenomena, you know, that, oh, the temperature is rising or, you know, my, my street is flooded, but also risk also encompasses, you know, the structures, the institutions, the policies, the inequalities that, that very much exist in society and which influence to a very great extent what marginalized communities can actually do in terms of action if they want to take, if they want to build for themselves a more sustainable future. But equally along with that is, uh, you know, uh, Priya is an organization that works at different levels and um, it clarified that risk is also something when viewed from above looks very different when it is viewed from below. Uh, the language used to describe risk is different if you are working at the global level or if you are a member of a marginalized community. And I'll give a quick example. Uh, for example, at the global level, we would say, you know, what can we do to maintain that global temperature does not rise, uh, you know, does not increase below uh, 1.5 degrees. Uh, but for a marginalized community, it could be, it could be like, you know, this rain came unseasonal. It came at the beginning of my uh, sowing season. And I'm worried, will I have enough income this year from my harvest? Uh, so how do I mitigate that risk? And so the meaning of climate risk cannot be homogenized. And how do we then include such diversity of experience, of knowledge from below into the climate conversation? Great, Sumitra. Thank you so much for such a succinct answer. And I think Celine agrees with you wholeheartedly. Um, Thank you. Now, apart from this uh, sort of incremental evolution in your understanding of climate risk, what would be one benefit of this process that you see as uh, one of the 55 organizations that engaged in it? And concurrently, 
one of the challenges that we faced while participating in this initiative sure so as with any process the benefits and the challenges are many but as an organization i would say that uh, the i think the the most tangible benefit uh from this uh, process that was run you know over a very short period of time very run very effectively i would say uh, is that we got introduced to many others uh some familiar uh, whom we've heard of possibly and uh several dissimilar others and uh you know the recognition coming together through these workshops recognizing that all of us are working actually towards the same goal or trying to create the same kind of you know impact for uh, marginalized communities and so there is this vast pool of diverse knowledge that now we can dip into and people you know friends whom we can reach out to uh, if we just want to learn something or get to know something uh, you know in a little more detail um challenges as i mentioned possibly many uh, some of which tom also uh, you know uh, spoke to but i would personally say uh, the challenge of you know um how do i remain committed to learning uh, at priya we we firmly believe that learning you know learning the learning process is actually beneficial if the individual commits to wanting to learn uh and if i want to learn then i will make that effort to learn and then use that learning to change the circumstances of my life but personally how do i balance this you know passion or desire to learn something new with other professional commitments one may have and related to this is how do i use this learning uh, for organizational benefit you know in what ways where does it fit in to the to the future strategic work that the organization wants to do and um, so so it's it's a it's a universal conundrum we we sort of grapple with it all the time uh but it's been a fascinating learning journey and um thank you to the ara for actually you know starting this process uh I, i representing the ara in this conversation i should be thanking you for engaging so enthusiastically in it but i just want to go back to the first part of your answer because i think being on the peripheries of this process i know that even more than the technical content of sort of understanding climate risk the raison d'etre of this initiative was network building and you referred to that in your answer can you illustrate what you mean when you say that uh you know stronger networks of connections were developed through this process with a with an example with a tangible example of any organization that you might have uh engaged with that you haven't before or any conversation that you might have had as a result of this explain that comment on um yeah. stronger networks developing as a result sure so i think uh, the push for it actually came you know uh, the 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 little assignment that we were asked to do between two workshops and uh, it was actually uh, quite beneficial that we were asked that you must reach out or you try and reach out to other organizations you know to to share your answers or or, or to even understand what you know each other are doing and uh, again very effectively very efficiently we were sent a list of all the organizations who were part of this uh, learning uh, process and we chose uh, three organizations we chose one in bangladesh uh, uh, one in the philippines and one in india itself uh, we chose them basis you know the different um, sort of roles that they play uh so the organization in bangladesh was was concerned with actually using evidence to influence policy and that's something that we want to learn it's something it's actually very difficult to do using local knowledge and local evidence to to sort of shape or influence policy at a higher level uh the organization in india actually involved with research and we thought you know if they are doing conventional forms of research and we we know uh, or we have experience with participatory research how can we then find that you know uh, sort of uh, connect and find how can our community based processes actually uh, feed into the kind of research that they do and with the organization in the philippines it was very interesting because they also work with urban informal communities and we are uh, we are particularly interested in understanding adaptation risk mitigation for urban informal uh, communities living in what very uh, commonly are known as slums and it is a it is a common problem across the global south and uh, they also used community based uh, methods 
And uh, we had a very interesting conversation around what are those community-based methods and then what are the challenges in trying to actually involve the community where in the co-creation process or you know, in the knowledge generation process, but if it doesn't lead to action, then what kind of uh, you know, uh, concerns and what kind of uh, things an organization needs to do in order to ensure that we are not extractive, we don't just take knowledge from the community, but we also give back. Great, Sumitaji. Now, given that uh, people who participated in this process seem to think it was useful. We're hoping that we might run it again at some point. Now, again, just like I asked Tom for his advice on what the Alliance can do uh, differently if we were to do this again, what would some words of wisdom and advice be from you for us? Well, if you look at the color of my hair, you may think that I have wise words to say, but um, again, I'll just speak from a personal experience. I think, um, you know, um, I mean, I'm at the outset, I must say that the process was run very effectively, very efficiently. And if, you know, one of your one of your goals was to ensure networking at regional and, you know, getting to, you know, uh, horizontal uh, connections. Yes, we did start that process. Um, this, this time, I think you ran the process where you started with a global workshop and then you sort of, you know, uh, came down to the regional level. Um, perhaps next time you could think of, you know, doing it truly bottom mm. up. So we start with, you know, uh, one is one is the levels and the other is the issues around which you have these learning workshops, you know. So do you start with, uh, with uh, you know, very local, maybe city or, uh, you know, even within a country, uh, sub-regional, sub-national levels? And then the diversity of knowledge that you get around the experiences of community adaptation, you systematize it and then you take, you know, what can be possibly uh, uh, generalized learnings. And I use the term generalized in a very, you know, quote unquote kind of way. And uh, then use that to see how can they influence uh, global policy or global commitments made by national governments. And also in terms of, you know, the issues that, that around which uh, you run the learning workshops, uh, learning topics which are sort of tailor-made for different contexts. I may be interested, for example, in adver- adaptation for and by urban poor living in uh, informal settlements. Somebody else may be interested in just understanding mm-hmm. adaptation uh, methods you know, for coastal communities, for example, or communities living in mountainous areas. So it sort of Mm -hmm. becomes a little more focused around particular issues or themes that one is interested in. And then you you share your experiences around a a very specific issue. But uh, beyond that, I would say that, you know, the ARA should continue to play this vital role uh, and contribute to building and bridging such horizontal connections, which is actually, you know, what one joins a network for. Vajji, thank you so much for really insightful responses. Uh, and we're looking forward to hearing more from you in the next component. Thank you, which, Aditya. Uh, which is an interactive exercise. We want to take advantage of having uh, people with so much excellent knowledge with us. I see we have Joannes uh, from Arin, we have Celine, we have Urti, and ARA uh, alumni. We have, of course, Tom and Sumitra and others and Leo Kadia. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Nora to just take, uh, just come on screen and talk to us about what she wants us to do over the next 15 minutes. Thank you, Aditya. Um, so let me just <laughs> make sure I have everything in order. Um, right, so the next, like Aditya said, the next part of this is just going to be a little bit more interactive. Uh, we would like everyone to you know, participate, turn your microphones off. If you'd like to say something, raise your hand, absolutely um, no worries. We're a smaller group today, so that's really fantastic for a great interactive discussion. Um, but basically at the center of the most recent working group to report by the IPCC, which I'm sure um, some of you have at least read the, um, the summary, not the 3,600 page um, entire uh, thing. I haven't read that entire thing myself. But at the center of this IPCC report is the idea of climate resilient development. Um, and this idea has not, it's not new. It's been around for some time. But the IPCC really 
um, flesh this out in their working group to uh, report. And this climate resilient development um, will be the anchoring concept for us for the next 15 minutes. So according to the IPCC, climate, climate resilient development integrates adaptation measures and their enabling conditions. So what enables adaptation measures um, to, you know, the good practice um, conditions with mitigation to advance sustainable development for all. So it integrates adaptation measures and their enabling conditions with mitigation to advance sustainable development for all. This is what the IPCC sees as climate resilient development. But we would like to better understand a few things. First, what the definition of climate resilient development that the IPCC brought forward means to you based on where you work, so your organization, the capacity in which you work, the level at which you work, global, regional, national, local. And then based on this reflection on what CRD or climate resilient development means to you, we want to know what the priorities of climate resilient development should be. And then second, we want to know what the ARA can do between now and the next Gabeshna in one year's time to advance these priorities. And third, how it should go about doing this. So we're gonna use a Jamboard for this. And for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Jamboards, it's a online sort of whiteboard, so to speak, or, or board where you put virtual sticky notes on it. I'm sure you've all used them um, before. And we will be using those to answer these kinds of three framing questions that I've that I've uh, I've pegged to you. So my colleague Sydney is going to be helping me populate these jam boards, and I see she's also going to be screen sharing, which is fantastic. Thanks, uh, Sydney. And um, we're just basically going to yeah to start off with with what you see climate resilient development. As, as being, do you agree with the IPCC definition? Um, what does that mean for you? And what should the priorities of climate resilient development be? Which I put down as CRD just to not have to continuously say climate resilient development. So I'm just gonna open the floor um, and ask people, yeah, just to come in with any kind of insights on this, on this question. And we request everyone to just go off mute. Let's just have a discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, let's not, and just, you can just talk and one of us will put a sticky for you or you can put a sticky or whichever way you think you want to do. Uh, and I think we have a question from Tasfia. Tasfia, thanks for your question. Um, basically means we just want you to identify the perspective from which you're going to answer this question. Because if you work at the local level, you might have a different idea of what climate resilient development is. If you work at the national level, it might be slightly different. So if you feel it's helpful, just color code your sticky uh, but if not, don't worry, just tell us what you see as climate resilient development. What is the first idea that comes to your mind? Celine? Thank you. Uh, and I, I really feel that um, we need to have the courage to go into the nuances because so much gets lost in translation with all this conversation. And I have been working on the front lines and I see even at the front lines, you're dealing with different levels of power and uh, not everybody is equal. And it's very, it's, it's a very delicate situation where people, you know, uh, where people actually uh, talk on behalf of vulnerable communities and they, don't, they do not necessarily represent it. And I feel, therefore, the LLA principles for me are so important because you actually find it's like a tool to get closer to the truth. And you're able to take sieve out all the other conversations and zero down into what is really important. So for me, in this whole thing of ARA, I feel if your resondatri is to come closer to the truth, then we really have to be able to do business, not as usual. And actually, yeah, move away beyond uh, the, the usual suspects and the normal conversations we have and have the courage, have the courage to get into the uncomfortable areas. Give us an example, Celine. What is an uncomfortable area? So, for example, I have on the front lines, I notice a lot of the agenda on the front line comes from where the money is coming from. Mm -hmm. So 
the funder has an agenda they find something sexy and you know everybody finds mukuru sexy for example right so mm-hmm. you're just taking this and you are broadcasting it and you're blasting it the poor community leaders who are there still don't understand what that means for them they may not necessarily feel it has been a very empowering process it may not be uh, a situation where there has been you know equality among different partners so i fe- yeah so do we have the courage in ara to be able to understand those processes to go deeper i i don't say everything has to be seen from its dark side but when you are able to deal with the pain and the uncomfortable things that have not worked in a process that's when the real change happens it's when you keep well, you know pretending everything is wonderful and great and this is an ex great example and that's the worry for me because that's not how it is on the ground and community leaders then struggle with that because one day it's climate next day it's health the third day it's something else and mm-hmm. they don't know how to they don't know how to juggle that and i don't know how to juggle that as well as a practitioner selin so just to push you uh, in response to the question that's mentioned here then would you say that developing an endogenous and bottom up vision of crde is the need of the hour a vision that's not led by the donors but by the people on the front lines as you say is that is that would would that be your response to this question yeah but to do that aditya it is like a hard process it's like pushing an elephant it doesn't happen easily because even the people who, the so called people who talk about the poor are actually not talking on their behalf so how do you as a researcher sitting there in ara know that how do you understand that nuance so what checks and balances do you have to put in place to understand that phenomenon great thanks any other responses we have lots of people who are experts in climate resilient development any insights to share with us on what is your understanding or vision of climate resilient development jesse you have your hand up Yes, thanks, Narendra. Did you? I actually, I just wanted to to jump in because I I think uh, Celine's point here was was excellent. But and the challenge before us, and and this is really what I wanted to highlight is as as Sumitra said before, you know that we're all of us are working towards the same goal, um, and so and, and this goal, as I said at the start, really is bringing science and knowledge into this action space. And Sumitra also mentioned the importance of of learning. You know, the learning while doing, learning by doing. and so aditya by pushing here a bit more you know selina on the comment of how does this actually look that is that's exactly the point and that's really kind of why we're asking this question here of how do you see it you know what what would this be from your vision um and as you'll see in in the next slide in just a moment it's really to then also kind of the follow up question is well what could the ara do to support this um because as as said the ara secretary here is really to put activities and processes in place to help support the members to work towards this kind of the shared goals um and shared visions that are outlined in the theory of change that of course anand um presented very quickly at the, at the very start so just to also kind of throw that in here to that ba- debate because i think it's been that that point of it being very complicated is great and so i would still ask but how can we do it or maybe the other question is well would that be a priority then and if so how could we do it so just to throw more fuel to the fire i guess thanks for that uh jessie um selene if you i'll give you a couple of minutes um perhaps to to think about uh an answer to jessie if you have one and feel free to come in then um if you do of, of what the area can do to to better prioritize that i'm going to let tom come in and then porty tom floor is yours if you'd like to uh to speak Yeah I I think it's my colleague Charles Tenui using my account um uh, mm-hmm. Charles Oh so, Okay it seems Charles is not there <laughs> Sorry yeah That's okay. it, we can go to Posty So Tom and Mia I was waiting uh, for you to hand over to me Okay oh. go ahead yeah, yeah. Yes uh, uh thank thank thanks a lot uh, Nora and and the team uh, I would like to share uh, the perspective from Africa Research and Impact Network I'm Charles Tonoy and I'm a, an engagement and policy analyst 
under the Africa Research and Impact Network. Uh, when we discuss um, climate risk resilient uh, development, the question comes um, around uh, risk. Uh, do we understand our local communities, uh, cities, subnational governments really define risk and um, their perception on risk? And we have spent, uh, I think this is the second year now, really engaging with the local uh, community-based organizations and the city officials in Nairobi to really understand how they're defining risk within their sectors and also within their context. And this is something that you are, is, is a bit uh, complex when you talk about risk because some define in terms of just basic activities. And of course, it's largely emergency oriented. And, and now when you talk of resilience, it means you have got to understand where you're going to study in terms of supporting. So what we have done uh, so far and what the uh, uh, funding support will go into is uh, especially the, 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 the labs where we're going to bring together the uh, local communities within uh, Mukuru informal settlement, but also the non-governmental organization and the city officials to really come together and come to a common understanding of what is risk and the cascading risk within uh, Mukuru because they have developed, yes, the special area plan but the implementation of this plan first was the plan risk pro. And what we found out is that there was no working group on, on, on risk, and, but we have managed to do institutional analysis, but also the extent to which they've integrated the parameters or the elements of risk that is hazard exposure and vulnerability. Recently, actually with Tom and the colleagues, we completed the first comprehensive risk and vulnerability assessment uh, for Mukuru and, and, and what is coming out very clearly is that there is need for capacity support at the local level and up to the city level to unpack risk within the context of Mukuru because the development dynamics and other dynamics which are coming in like the environmental uh, induced or, or climate induced risk is that the approach will be different, not like the other informal sentiment or even at the city level. So um, okay. the, question, the question around um, what should be the priority uh, when it comes to climate resilience is first to think around are the development agenda or the infrastructure being deployed due to the uh, Mukuru SPA plan which is being implemented which is now already uh, triggering uh, improvement of road infrastructure are those road infrastructure risk proof and and, 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 the, and the perception largely from the community is that the infrastructure will not be necessary or will not be an ultimate a solution in terms of reducing risk, but there is a chances of that risk could be enhanced again. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, that's really useful. I think it's being captured uh, as, as you speak. Um, Sumitra and Purti, I hope it's okay if we keep your input for the next two slides on which we also need help. Um, and I'll request it need to move to slide number two. So as Anand and Jesse said, we were here a year ago where we started to launch the development of the ARA. And we've done a lot in the last one year, but we also want to use this occasion to ask you about what the ARA can do between now and the next Gobeshana conference. What would you like to see from us when we meet a year from today, presenting our report card back to you? And also as you do this, not only Tell us about the results you'd like to achieve, but also the means um, and the mechanisms through which you think we should achieve these. Any thoughts and suggestions? Uh, Purti, you're an ARA alumni. Where do you think we should be going? Hi, Aditya. Thanks. Uh, I was just typing fast and I just posted it on the slide here right now. Um, it's fantastic, first of all, to see the progress that ARA has been making. Yes, as you mentioned, I'm an, an alumna of ARA, um, and I feel a lot of nostalgia watching where, where ARA has come now. Uh, but now, sitting where I am in the UN Development Coordination Office, uh, focused on uh, climate, environment, and food systems, my, my role is really to support and empower the UN resident coordinators. You may not be familiar that for each uh, uh, developing country, the UN country teams that are present, for example, UNDP, FAO, all of the technical agencies that are present are coordinated by a resident coordinator that's really seen as the head of the UN system in, in the country. So we're going through a major reform effort uh, where the RC, the resident coordinator, uh, is being seen as um, sort of 
a central actor to help empower and convene the whole ecosystem of actors for climate environment uh, development issues. So exactly what ARA seems to have at the center of its uh, its ethos, you know, we can't do this alone. We need all of the ecosystem of actors. And the RC system there, the UN, has this unique advantage of being a very powerful convener with the national government, with the decision makers. Exactly what I think seems to be maybe uh, something that could be improved with the with the ARA. So in terms of what the ARA could do between now and the next Gobeshna conference, I would really see a strategic collaboration with the UN country teams, uh, perhaps to the Development Coordination Office, where the ARA can be sort of like the operational supporting arm for these resident coordinators to convene the the ecosystem of actors, could be quite valuable to push forward uh, the climate resilient uh, development agenda. And one particular um, issue that I see as uh, we can move on quickly is on food systems. I saw in your uh, presentation, in uh, Anand's presentation, I think it was, that food systems um, is one of the, the priorities. I think it was under the, the, the constructive dialogues. So we've had the food system summit uh, last year and there's a follow-up mechanism where there's quite a bit of activity uh, coordinated by UN country teams with all of the different types of actors on kind of creating costed national development plans on food systems. So a strategic collaboration here between the UN system and the ARA I think would be really valuable in the next year. Um, and uh, as DCO, we, we stand ready to, to be an ally on this. Okay, thank you so much for such a focused and helpful suggestion. Uh, it, this suggestion is particularly nice because it also allows to drag you back in um, to the ARA. <laughs> so thank you uh, so much for that. Uh, I'm going to come to Sumitra Ji, I see your hand up. But before that, I want to give Asfia a chance to talk through her sticky. Thank you so much, Aditya. I hope all of, uh, all of you all can hear me. Yes, perfectly. So yeah, uh, uh, we are. Uh, I'm. I'm. Tasfi, I'm basically from ICAD, International Center for Climate Change and Development. I'm working as a program coordinator for the Nature Based Solutions. So basically, we bid for a proposal and we got it thankfully. But uh, uh, this this is a great initiative that the thing that AIR is doing. But uh, I personally feel like that the timelines that we got and I had a big chat with Julia about that as well that the timeline is a little tight for, for delivering on activities just in three months. So probably to be more flexible on the timing, uh, like six months to 12 months, depending on the size of the projects and the scale, scalability and uh, of the projects as well. And as well as uh, to make more, uh, to make this platform a more collaborative one, because you already mentioned that you have over 140 organizations. So I'm not sure that if there is a platform where we all can interact with each other based on our needs, if we need to submit any bigger proposals or not. So I, I feel like that uh, if we all can interact with each other, we all can also make something bigger because, yeah, so that we will be able to make some changes uh, by by ourselves, the, the organizations that are receiving the, the smaller grants. Uh, Thanks yeah. a lot, Tasfia. Both excellent points. Just on the platform part, we are currently in the process of starting the development of that platform, and we will be coming to all of you for advice and input on how that should be shaped. Um, Sumitraji, the floor is yours. And also, there are others, uh, Celine, Joannes, Tom, and others, Charles. I know all of you have uh, very kindly supported the development of the ARA and up till now. Tell us what you'd like to see from us in the next one year. This is your chance for us to give us suggestions on what we should do. But Sumitra Ji, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aditya. Uh, you know, I've been thinking a bit about um, what the ARA can do. And um, sort of, if we go back and look at some of the principles that ARA stands for, and you know, which we've all signed up for, uh, you're, you're talking about research addressing structural inequities and inequalities. Uh, which we, we want that, you know, um, scientific or expert knowledge uh, benefits from or works together with community-based uh, knowledge. And, uh, you know, for these things to, to happen, you need to build capacities. You need to build capacities in communities uh, where, so that they can undertake the research they can share their experience with the expert 
and the the role of the expert actually is to you to to bring that to give that community knowledge visibility uh without that i re- i i fear that we may remain a sort of you know a top down kind of you know this is what we think the problem is and you know ca- can you go to the community and find out what they are thinking about it kind of approach and and you know the the uh, the other thing i would like to sort of sort of bring up and i don't know how possible that's going to be within one year several people have spoken about it the time you know the time factor but i also think that um the the experience we are having with the micro grant is that issues remain the same and the issues have always been there for marginalized communities uh us going in now and saying you know this is a climate risk or this is a climate uh, problem uh actually means that uh, they they need to we are we are asking them to see it uh from a different perspective we are asking them to actually have a more long term view of their own challenges and and the solutions they can find for it so if if we want them to take this long term view then our uh, engagement and association with these communities also has to be for the long term it cannot be a, a sort of you know a quick eight week kind of you know dipping in and tell yeah. us what your problems are kind of uh, uh, approach uh it's not going to be very sustainable or work right. for very long we've been able to do it again I, because in one of the communities we have been working for the past 2 years so we we already have a level of trust in another one we we were able to actually uh, work with a community based organization who has that level of trust in the community but without that this this it wouldn't right. have been possible to do the micro grant right. thanks a lot sumit ji i think we uh, thank you for that comment and also thank you to others who been contributing to the jam board uh, so positively all fantastic suggestions i'm going to give a 5 second pause here for any other uh, participants with burning issues to contribute now uh, or feel free to keep putting post post its or stickies onto the jam board uh, before i hand the mic to jessie since we are already 4 minutes over the time uh, for the session any burning issues going once Jonas flows yours right. <laughs> uh right thank thank you very much uh, here um I've actually put my points on the chat because I've, I've actually been <coughs> listening quite a lot to some of the uh, very strategic points uh, which have been made by colleagues and and I think these are really very helpful in terms of uh, supporting the arab mission so first of all let me say uh, thank you a big thank you to ara Uh, by basically um initiating a very novel uh, global uh, approach to really coordinating and bringing up uh, the adaptation initiatives um from the different regions and and you know sort of strengthening the networks that can then uh, not only talk about adaptation but all, can also profile um what would call the locally led actions uh, to the to the global level so in terms of maybe just a quick one i, I just wanted to mention this because i think it's important for ara when you think about you know um how we want to move or how we want to move and and in between now and the next conference and of course other conference uh, i think one is that we need to really understand clearly what is the niche that we are trying to proclaim in this case uh, and i'm saying this because there's a lot of people a lot of um, um a lot of consortiums and and you know experts projects which are doing a lot of adaptation work uh but ara is uh, basically coming in to really strengthen the learning element of the contexts and and the locally led actions the experiences best practices so that kind of niche uh, perhaps needs to be well uh, articulated in 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 the reporting and i think part of this have been um highlighted by salin who basically said uh, you know to what extent can we go in terms of unpacking some of the hidden issues around locally led adaptation one of the key things that i want to mention is that lla llas have been actually um, promoted a lot by different actors and there's a lot of passion for it but there's no one who understands some of these underlying systemic issues that either impede or promote locally led uh, adaptation and how this could be perhaps um, uh, addressed or even profiled better in the decision making uh, spaces and i think finally um 
So that links to the element about the connection to the policy processes. Uh, I think ARA is doing a good job. We, we are having a connection with the UNFCC process, uh, but I think there would be a, a good opportunity really to build back in terms of trying to strengthen uh, the linkage between some of this learning and the, 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 the policy processes at the sub-national and, and national uh, levels, which again, of course, is already taking place through the micro grants that have been provided, like what Arene is doing, uh, but certainly, I think that also needs to be, you know, you know, to be to 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 start coming up much more clearly. And finally, coordination and and sort of um, strengthening the various networks. I think there are, are very good networks that are emerging um, from the different micro grantees and colleagues have also highlighted this. So the question is, how are we going to continue uh, strengthening this network so that they are able to provide spaces for, for continuous learning? and continuous discussions uh, along the issues that ARA is basically um, uh, looking at. I had one quick point for the last, uh, for the last question, uh, the previous question about uh, climate compatible development or something like that. Uh, but I think I will maybe write it and share it too. Thanks. Is it mute? You're mute, Sadiut. Oh, apologies for that. Um, I just wanted to thank you very much for your comprehensive response. And we put all of them on the Jamboard. I think as an alliance, we have a lot to learn from Arin, who's done many of these things uh, before we have. So we'll continue to draw on your expertise. But given that we are uh, eight minutes over time, I will hand over to Jesse to close the session and talk about next steps. Great. Thank you very much, Aditya. And thank you, everyone, for your inputs here. Um, as Sydney said at the start, it was going to be a small group, but small but sweet. Um, and I think it was exactly that. Um, as Joannes mentioned, he had another point to add on the climate resilient development. Um, you all have the link to the Jamboard, so please do continue to put, um, put your thoughts in there. If you have other ideas, um, feel free to add them now. So just because we're closing this session doesn't mean that the conversation won't continue. Um, and that's actually what, what, of course, the AIR is, is really all about, is bringing together um, actors like we are here today to, to discuss these issues um, and always discuss them. This is what our intention here about the, the, the priorities and from where, where you are sitting, as Nora said, is because we recognize that we come from diverse backgrounds, from diver diverse geographic areas um, and diverse organizations. And therefore, we, we each have a different lens in which way we, we see things. And what we really want to do is bring together these different lenses and visions to ensure that we are working together um, in a collaborative fashion towards one shared goal. Um, so I think that the, the comments um, it was also really, the, the comments we had today was really helpful on this last session, but it was also really great to hear from, um, from Tom and Sumitra. So thank you very much for that, uh, as well as to Julio. Uh, and to Nora for sharing a bit more information on the climate risk learning journeys um, and the micro grants. And of course, Aditya for facilitating and Anand for, for opening. Um, just very quickly on, on last, uh, let's say next steps is we want to take this information and we are currently developing a one year and also a three year work, prep, uh, work plan and strategy for the ARA. And this is something that is, um, will be an iterative process. We'll be of course, reaching out um, for a comment and working very closely with the steering board. Um, and that will be something that, that we'll be feeding back to, of course, um, within, the, within the various ARA members and, of course, with, with our plenary eventually. Um, one other important thing, I think, and something that everyone is waiting for is this tracking learning and sharing mechanism, the online platform, the kind of the more in-person opportunities to really to learn and to share. Um, all that is is in the pipeline. And we will we'll very likely set up a, a Slack channel in the short term because we recognize, as many of you have said today, members really want to reach out to each other, really want to start discussing some of this stuff. Um, and we want to facilitate that. That will ultimately be in this tracking, learning, and sharing platform. Um, but maybe we can get something up in the, in the meanwhile since we don't want to delay these, these really rich conversations to go on um, from now until that platform is up. And with that... Um, just to say thank you all very much again for the time, for the commitment. Um, as Aditya had mentioned, that many of you on, on, this, on this session are already um, either ARA alumni or even just ARA supporters and really kind of playing a key role in, in the microgrants, in the learning journeys, and just in the, the general conversations as well. So thank you all very much. Um, I wish you a wonderful rest of the Gobe Shona Conference, and I also look forward to being in touch um, on the ARA front for various matters. 
So thank you all very much.